thanks again for your warm welcome. Really do appreciate it. Um, let me just, so I'm budgeting my time correctly here. What What is our time frame? We're going to finish at 6.30. Okay, 6.30 is, okay, so Q&A has to happen before 6.30. All right, 6.15 and then 15 minutes to clear up all, con okay. <laughs> or <laughs> no, I'm, I'm about, I, I intend to create some confusion, but hopefully in the direction of orthodoxy, um, <laughs> if I can, if, if that's possible. Um, good, I want to begin with a text of scripture. Uh, we'll refer back to some texts uh, as we take up this doctrine of, of uh divine simplicity, and I'm also I'm thankful to see uh, a few of my victims here, that is to say, former students of mine um, who have uh, sat under my, uh, my teaching in the past, and I'm encouraged by their continued interest uh, in these things. The Apostle Paul says uh, in Romans 11.36, these most memorable words, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. When we come to the doctrine of divine simplicity, uh, it may sound like a rather um, odd doctrine. Um, what is this doctrine? What is it intended to do? Is it that important? Uh, maybe just a couple words of how I found my own way into this doctrine, and my way into this doctrine wasn't, I, I simply mean how it is that this doctrine was put on my radar and sort of elevated in my thought. Um, I'll confess at the outset that it does sound perhaps a bit odd to our modern ears to say that God is simple. Uh, and in fact, that might almost sound insulting as if it were to say simplistic or something like that. Uh, and certainly we don't mean anything insulting by this. In fact, quite the opposite. Uh, we intend to say something about the, about the unsurpassability of God's greatness. Simplicity is in fact contrary to what you might be thinking at this very moment, um, one way in which the church has done this in the past. Part of my own interest in the doctrine uh, was stirred up when I began to see uh, repeated references to it uh, in both Protestant literature, but also medieval literature uh, and in ancient church literature. And it turns out that um, if, we, if we do a little searching, that this doctrine of divine simplicity is really a Christian commonplace historically. That is to say, up until, uh, let us say, the middle of the 18th century, uh, this is something that, how can I say it, is bread and butter orthodoxy. Everybody, everywhere, thought that this was true, and that's hardly an exaggeration. Eastern Orthodoxy, medieval Roman Catholicism, all branches of Protestantism, Reformed, Lutheran, and Arminian, all of them held that God was simple and confessed that God was simple. When it comes to our family of Reformed confessions, uh, we find this statement uh, in the little clause uh, in chapter 2, section 1, if you're looking at the Second London Confession or at the Westminster Confession, um, or if you're looking at Article 1 of the 39 Articles of the Church of England, which is actually where the Presbyterians and the Baptists, oh, and the Savoy Declaration, no, sorry to leave out the Congregationalists. Um, every, in other words, where are the 17th century Baptists and Congregationalists and Presbyterians getting this little phrase that God is without body, parts, or passions. Well, in terms of the immediate uh, antecedent to that, they're all getting it from the 39 Articles of the Church of England from 1563. Now, where did they get that little expression? Probably they got it from the first Protestant Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, Thomas Cramner. Where did Thomas Cramner decide to say that God is without parts? It was just simply part of the medieval inherit, uh, heritage that he had received uh, and passed on. In other words, the Protestant Reformation wasn't about the total explosion and demolition of everything that had ever gone before it. There were certain things that certainly were not going to be uh, traded away. Uh, the death and the resurrection of Christ was something that long predates uh, the Protestant Reformation. The triunity of God long predates the, uh, the Protestant Reformation. Um, the self-sufficiency of God, as we call it, the aseity of God, the eternality of God, but also the Doctrines like the impassibility of God and the simplicity of God. These were also parts of that sort of broad Christian inheritance that our Protestant forebears very wisely preserved intact and even ensconced in their declarations and confessions of the faith. So there it was in all of the confessions, 
Pro, uh, Presbyterians and Baptists and Congregationalists and Anglicans, and you could find it also in the Lutheran literature as well. Um, and then in all of the medieval fathers that went before them and the earlier fathers like Augustine and others that went before them. And so uh, I guess it, it began to sort of settle on me that this is, this is a big deal in the popular mindset of historic Christianity. I mean, all the way up to someone like John Gill, a Baptist pastor writing in the 18th century. Um, when John Gill writes on divine simplicity, it could just as well have been Thomas Aquinas writing on divine simplicity from 500 years earlier. It sounds virtually the same. So what is this doctrine? Uh, what are we saying? And why, and I want to start sort of from a polemical standpoint, why does it sound initially wrong to our ears? to say that God is simple. And I submit a couple of reasons why it might sound especially odd for us to call God simple. Perhaps one of the reasons is that we think, in, when we think in terms of power and productivity, it seems to us that things that are complex and multi-part are more uniquely capable of performing great and powerful operations than simple things. You might think, for instance, of the difference in terms of a, a mode of transportation, a Boeing 747 on the one side, uh, which has about six million parts, give or take a few, uh, and a unicycle on the other side. Both are means of transportation. But one of them is clearly more powerful and effective at doing the job than the other one. And I don't have to tell you which one it is. It's the one with more parts. Okay? Um, jet engines and, and the power to thrust and to hold together hundreds of people sitting relatively comfortably in seats uh, with climate control. You know, in other words, this ability to produce an outcome, moving people in this case, is more within the power of the multi-part thing than it is of the simpler thing like a unicycle, for instance. And it's easy for us to think that in that respect, if doing great things is more within the power of multi-part things as opposed to simpler objects, that creating, which seems to require the most power ever okay, to make a world out of nothing, uh, would require that God be extremely complex. In other words, that he have very many parts I mean, if it takes 6 million parts to cause a Boeing 747 to exercise its unique power, how, much more, how many more parts would be necessary for God to exercise an exponentially even greater power than that? And so we think to ourselves, more parts equal more power. And I, I don't want to say that's all wrong. It isn't all wrong if what we're comparing is one composite thing to another composite thing between one composite and another composite, to say that one with more parts is more powerful than one with fewer parts is, I'm not going to argue that. That's, that, sound, that absolutely sounds correct and true, I think, because it is correct and true. But what would be wrong, this now to the Christian, mind, the Christian conviction, what would be wrong with saying that that's how it is with God? That God must be multi-parted uh, in order to do such great and amazing feats that he, in fact, does. And the reason uh, this is wrong is very uh, simple, no pun intended, uh, and it's just simply this. That things that are composed of parts depend upon their parts to be as they are. In other words, there's a dependency relationship between composite holes, like a unicycle and its parts, or a Boeing 747 and its parts, um, and the things out of which they are composed. If I can put it like that. A Boeing 747 depends upon lots of nuts and bolts and screws and whatever it is that makes that combustion happen with jet fuel and et cetera. In other words, lots of things not a Boeing 747 are required for a Boeing 747 to be and to operate. But nothing that is not God, do you go watch this, is required for God to be and to operate. In other words, Everything composed of parts is reducible to basic units of being more fundamental than itself. Everything composed of parts depends upon the parts of which it is composed. That if you don't, if you don't, I know that's not very, com it's not a difficult statement, but if you don't grasp that basic conviction, uh, then the tradition, the Christian tradition's denial that God has parts will be lost on you, and it will just sound like um, some supreme insult, perhaps. Um, <laughs> 
in recent theology, and by recent theology, I don't mean theology in the last 10 years, but I mean uh, by recent, uh, the last 250 years uh, in theology, that's still recent. Uh, in recent theology, we find um, an increasing scarcity of the doctrine of simplicity. In other words, the Christian tradition doesn't decide in the middle of the 18th century um, to necessarily attack and bury the doctrine of simplicity as much as it it starts to lose sight of what the doctrine of simplicity is supposed to do. And in fact, uh, what we start to see uh, in the late 18th century, certainly in the 19th century, is that when people start to talk about parts, increasingly they begin to think about parts in terms of material bits. Um, And I certainly, I mean, I'll confess, for for the longest time I think I read that little expression that God is without body parts or passions as if it were saying that God is without body parts and passions. Now, the passions thing was kind of weird to me and took some years to sort of unpack what that meant. And um, uh, full disclosure, I wrote, a, I wrote a paper when I was in seminary explaining why the denial of passions was, in fact, wrong. Um, and that it was well-meaning and well-intentioned, but they were overthinking it and missing the point that God really was passionate. I'll leave that aside for this evening. The body parts thing, that sounded a little more straightforward. God doesn't have body parts. Well, sure, he doesn't have body parts because God is a spirit and does not have a body like men. If you've done your children's catechism, you know. Um, God, is a, God is a spirit, does not have a body like men. So, of course, he doesn't have body parts. But if you look at the confessions and go all the way back to the 39 articles and even to Cranmer's language, um, he does put a comma between body and parts. He seems to be saying something more when we deny parts of God than simply that he doesn't have physical bits. Okay? Um, of course, that's true. And by the way, that is a part of the doctrine of simplicity, um, that God does, is not composed of um, material bits or even of matter and form. Uh, but when they say that God has no parts, they're saying something much broader. And I'll try to unpack in a few minutes um, a little bit of what, they, what it is that they were denying when they said that God has parts. In recent theology, though, this has become increasingly either relegated to the denial that God has a body, and therefore body parts, um, or to no mention at all. Or, at, or even worse, some have perceived that maybe this is at odds with the Trinity. Okay? God is three persons. Those three persons are not the same person. The Father is not the Son and Spirit. The Son is not the Father and Spirit. Spirit is not the Father and Son. Uh, therefore, there must be three parts of God. Uh, my former students will remember uh, that I harp on this in class, that you have to stop saying there are three parts of God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. They're not parts. They're persons. Uh, and there are lots of reasons not to call them parts. Well, that will become clear, actually, in just a moment. Why? Whatever that is, the Trinity, it's not a three-part thing that produces a whole. Okay? Um, we'll have to think about that in a different way. Louis Burkhoff, writing in the 1930s, says, In recent works on theology, the simplicity of God is seldom mentioned. Many theologians positively deny it, either because it is regarded as purely metaphysical abstraction, or because in their estimation it conflicts with the doctrine of the Trinity. These are just some of the reasons why evangelicals uh, in the early 20th century were just not talking about the doctrine much anymore. Frank Sheed, who's a Catholic layman, um, but uh, a remarkable theologian in his own right, uh, giving a lecture at um, the Catholic School of Theology, summer of 1930 at Cambridge University, said this. He said, a study of what is happening to theology in its higher reaches would almost certainly take as its starting point the attribute of simplicity and show that every current heresy begins by being wrong on that. End quote which just sounds like a fabulous overstatement if the doctrine of simplicity is something you've never heard of. You're you're thinking to yourself, wait a minute, the problem with everything in theology today is this doctrine I've never heard of? That just doesn't sound right. You know what I mean? That just doesn't, it's just, you can't, this, that, that just, uh, and I have, uh, I've become convinced that Sheed's concern, his alarm in 1930, uh, may be more relevant today than ever, uh, that he was actually on to something, that in fact a lot of what troubles us, especially with regard to errors re, uh, regarding God, um, is either a denial of or a failure to appreciate divine simplicity, and I'll, I'll put myself in that, uh, errors that I think I made, not willfully or high-handedly, and not such as to sort of disenfranchise me from true religion, but errors nonetheless that were indeed problematic were errors that I made, I think, because the doctrine of simplicity was a relative unknown. All right, my goals here tonight, uh, 
first of all, they are too many and too lofty to attain, but here's the, here's, here they are in the perfect world. Um, first, to set forth the basic claims and the implications of the doctrine of simplicity. Basically, what are we saying? Why are we saying it? What does it mean? Um, and I'm going to try to make that, uh, we could unpack that for days and days, but I just want to be sort of quick and to the point about it. Secondly, to identify some of the main biblical and theological arguments in support of it. In other words, you're thinking, I don't, 1 Corinthians 10, you know, listen, my dear Corinthians, uh, do not dispute about this doctrine of simplicity. In other, no, that text doesn't exist. All right, where, where does the Bible support this notion, or how does the Bible support this notion that God is simple? Uh, in addition to that, and I'll just be selective, I want to let you sort of listen in to some of the voices of Christian past uh, who have spoken to this doctrine, and I want to give a kind of broad stretch from the early church to the high medieval period. And you might think to yourself, well, what about the Protestants? Um, the Protestants basically reproduce that almost exactly, um, adding some biblical arguments to it that may have been lacking, but basically upholding the exact same doctrine. So we'll kind of listen in and try to hear a little bit from you know, the A-team, Athanasius and Augustine and Anselm and Aquinas, um, and sort of hear, hear their voices, what they say. I'll make the argument, and if you get the book, you can see where I document some of this. Um, the basically, the same arguments are picked up in the Protestant tradition, whether it's Thomas Cramner uh, for the Anglicans, or whether it's uh, William Perkins or John Owen or Stephen Charnock um, or even George Swinock, uh, you'll find the same doctrine sort of recurring in their writings. Um, if we accomplish that, um, introduction to the doctrine, a brief survey of biblical and theological foundations, listen to the past, and if we have 20, or 20 minutes or so, um, I want to raise a, f a few of the modern objections to the doctrine, the ones that are made by people still living, those kind of objections, um, and, just, and just briefly sort of state why I think the doctrine of simplicity um, does not actually fall to those critiques. Um, so a few things. Let's just get first down into... Uh, this, the basic claims and implications of divine simplicity. What does it mean when we say that God is simple? Very, very simply, the chief claim is that God is not composed of parts. That is the, that is the core claim. It's an, in this sense, it's a negative doctrine, meaning we're saying something God is not. Now, this is, it's built upon what God is, but it's a negative claim. We're saying that God is not composed of parts. The reason for this is that whatever is composed of parts depends upon those parts to be as it is. There's a dependency relation in everything composed of parts. If I could define a part, now you're thinking, okay, parts, parts, parts. I, what does he mean by a part? It's, this is, this is the, the best job I can do, and I'm sure someone can do it better, of breaking it down. A part is anything in a subject that is less than the whole and without which the subject would be really different than it is. A part is less than a whole. That is to say, whatever the being of the whole is, it is greater than the part. If it were not greater than the part, or if the part were equal to the whole, the part would just be the whole, in which case it wouldn't be a part. In all part-whole relations, there is, uh, there is a sort of um, lesser, greater than relationship. In addition to this, all composite things need their parts in order to exist as they do. Parts give being. Parts make things to be in a certain way. So I'll just take a, a, an object composed of parts, with which you're all familiar, and that's your automobile. It's, it's built up out of various parts, uh, four tires, uh, a drive shaft, a steering column, uh, fuel injectors, uh, a fuel pump, uh, a fan, uh, and no, no, I'm going to stop right there and I'll show my incompetence when it comes to m vehicle parts. But when it comes to your car, none of those things is your car. You're driving your Toyota Camry. Um, those four tires are not your Toyota Camry. That steering wheel is not your Toyota Camry. That air compressor that gives you nice climate in the cab is not your Toyota Camry. Um, the axles that turn the wheels are not your Toyota Camry. Your Toyota Camry is the sum total of these parts. None of these parts is itself a car you can drive. But the car you can drive depends upon those parts in order to be and to function as it does. Its being and its operation depends, I mean, let's put it this way, your tires are not your car, but your car would certainly be worse off without them. Do we get the idea? So that 
a whole thing that is composed of parts, I'm using a material example because it's easiest, um, depends upon those parts for something. If I can put it th this way, parts give being or actuality. Not the totality of actuality, because your car is more than your parts, um, but they give something. And if you took away a part, or if a part were, were to be deprived of a thing, a thing would lose some actuality and perhaps even power or operation to just that extent. If I took the steering wheel out of your car and left everything else intact, um, the, the power, the ability of your car to operate um, as well as it does currently would be taken out. Things depend upon parts. Parts give being, but parts are not equal to the being of wholes. I know this, is, this sounds like it's a lot, but it's really very straightforward. You live the, every day. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Why then do we say that this is not true of God? Because God does not depend upon something more basic or fundamental than himself as God. God doesn't depend on something more primitive or basic than godness in order to be God. Um, moreover, things that are composed of parts are not just dependent upon their parts, but they're also dependent on whatever supplies unity to those parts. So back to your Toyota Camry, um, you get the idea that your car and all of its operations depends upon the parts that are in it. But there's also another dependency. Your car depends also upon whatever put the parts together. That is to say, uh, if we can put it this way, whatever funds the unity of the parts. Because your, par your Toyota Camry is not sitting, I don't know how many parts are in a Toyota Camry, thousands I'm sure, uh, are not sitting each individually there in your garage, okay? Rather, they are integrated, we say. That is to say, they are put together in such a way as to comprise a whole. Okay. But you know that's not how it started, right? I mean, I take it that so, some, in some factory somewhere, um, somebody's like working the air compressors, and then someone else is making tires, and someone else is making drive shafts and, and axles uh, and fuel pumps, and someone else is working the fans. And all of these things in a certain sense, are prior to the whole. The Toyota Camry was put together out of parts, to put it very simply. Okay? Things composed of parts require compo a power of composition. That is to say, something to actually put it together. Somebody, you know, somebody in Detroit, Mich Michigan uh, is you know, power screwing bumpers onto the back of cars and tires. And in other words, things composed of parts are dependent in a twofold way. They depend upon their parts as such. They also depend on whatever supplies unity to them. Okay? And for these reasons, the Christian tradition denies that God is composed of parts, or, or rather says he is without parts, because otherwise God would be doubly dependent in order for, it, for his being on the parts, on whatever put them together, a composer. Because God cannot depend on what is not God in order to be God, this is a fundamental biblical conviction. Um, in fact, when I ask people, um, you know, if I bring up the doctrine of simplicity, they kind of think, oh, that sounds odd. But really, this is the core. The core of the doctrine is this basic biblical, this basic Christian conviction, and it's this that nothing that is not God makes God be God. Are we. I think we can, I know sound, you think that sounds, it's not as complicated as I'm making it sound. Um, it's actually very straightforward. Nothing that is not God makes God be God. That is the heart of divine simplicity. Divine simplicity is basically just an elaboration of that Christian conviction. It's a way of carrying out that conviction that God is absolutely irreducible in his being. When I say irreducible, I don't mean that he's... Um, unimpressive or unpowerful what I mean is you can't get down underneath him you can't find some thing in being that is more fundamental than God himself God when you get down underneath all the being what's down there so to speak what's what's holding it all together what funds the actuality of everything it's God himself what funds God's actuality nothing in other words, God's actuality is not derived. His being is not derived. His being does not come from another. But the being of composite entities does. It comes from whatever funds the unity. It comes from the parts that are comprised together in the unity. So if God does not depend on what is not God in order to be God, then it seems to follow negatively that we should say God is without parts. That's really, if you want to get down to it, that's the heart of this doctrine. And I would argue, if you've never even heard of the doctrine of simplicity, 
or heard the expression God is without parts, but you believe in your heart that nothing that is not God makes God be God, you're, you're already into the orthodox inner sanctum. Okay? You're, al- you're already at the heart of what this is about. This is just a way of ensuring that as we go along in our theology, we don't give away that conviction. And I think this is the danger, is that we can all have that conviction, but making sure that we don't say things theologically that start to compromise that conviction is a little bit more of a difficult project. Divine simplicity is really a way of guarding that basic Christian conviction of God's fundamentality and irreducibility of being. Now, a number of implications follow from this immediately when we say that God is not composed of parts. And this is where, I hope you're with me this far, this is where I'm going to just I'm going to strain you a little bit um, in terms of the kinds of parts we're denying. When we say God is not composed of parts, um, the, the early church theologians and the medieval theologians and the Protestant uh, Puritan theologians um, all had quite a textured notion of what parts of what kinds of parts could be composed to make an entity. And it's not what you're thinking. We could start very basically and say God's not composed of physical parts a bit of this matter and a bit of that matter and put them together and you got a little bigger unit of matter than you had before, okay? We can say, of course, it denies that. It also means that he's not composed of form and matter. This is going to sound a little strange to you. Doesn't that, isn't that just matter and matter? Um, Just a little, stay with me, if you will. Um, Form is that which supplies uh, whatness to a thing. In other words, a form, when, you're th- when you think form, you think a shape of matter, but don't stop thinking that right now for the moment. Um, a form is actually what makes matter the kind of matter that it is, for instance. Um, so if I'll, I'll just, in this, ro- in this room, there are a whole bunch of physical bodies sitting in chairs. And if I were to ask, and by the way, the f- chairs also are physical bodies of a different kind. By the way, the reason you can sit on the chair, but no one can sit on you you ready for this, is because you're not the same kind of body it is. In other words, we already accept that not every body, not, no, I don't mean everybody, I mean every, every, pause, body, is the same sort of body. We have, this is a body, it's a physical object distended in space. Um, you are a body, that chair is a body, your backpack is a body, a tree is a body. In other words, but these are not all the same kind of body. What makes hunks of matter different? kinds of hunks of matter. This is, I'm saying as basically as I can. Form is what does it. That is to say, not merely shape and configuration, but rather that which supplies kind. Or if I can put it this way, your essence, if you will. In other words, the essence of your hunk of matter, that that makes your hunk of matter the kind of hunk of matter it is, namely a human hunk of matter, is the essence of humanity. the thing that makes uh, you know, your dog Rover's hunk of matter a uh, dog hunk of matter is the form caninity. And for your cat, you know what it is, it's canin- it's felinity. And your horse has got equanimity and your cow's got bovinity. Then when you get when you get out into the into the into you know out of the fla- fauna and into the floral, um, I don't know, trees, I think it's like something like arbority or something like this. In other words, there's something that makes matter to be a certain kind. Okay? But what makes matter to be a certain kind is not itself just more matter. It's, it's an immaterial principle that determines matter to be of a certain sort. Well, God is not composed of that way either. I mean, of course, because he's not material. So we can think about material composition this way. Um, a bit of matter like my elbow and my shoulder and my knees and you know, throw it all together. We can also think of material composition this way. Whatever it is that makes my kind of matter the kind of matter that it is. That's form and matter. God's not composed that way either. In addition to this, there are several other ways in which things can be composed of units of being more basic than the whole. Most fundamentally, now I'm just going to cut right down to the bone on this, most fundamentally, the distinction that characterizes every creature is the distinction between existence and essence. Existence and essence. What you are and that you are are not true of you in virtue of the same thing. You might think to yourself, what's he getting at? All right. Um, if I take Josh and I say, um, what is Josh? I'm asking a question about the kind of thing Josh is. What is Josh? I'm asking a question about his essence. What kind of thing is he? And you say to me, Josh exists. Would you have answered my question? I mean, I could say that about Josh's chair and Josh's T-shirt uh, and Josh's phone. 
and Josh's car and Josh's bed. You have done nothing to help me understand his essence by saying that he exists. You've answered an essence question with an existence answer. Okay? The reason is uh, because the essence and the existence are, in fact, distinct in Josh. Now, if I put the question the other way around, I said, does Josh exist? And you, uh, being a good Aristotelian, said, Josh is a rational animal. That's not the same thing as telling me whether there are any. You know what I'm getting at? In other words, if I, I mean, let's just take an extinct thing like a dodo bird. I don't know what the essence of technical name is for the essence of a dodo bird. But if I said, um, do dodo birds exist? And you, and you proceeded to give me a sort of textbook answer to what the essence of a dodo bird is, uh, you would not have answered my question. I'm not asking, what is it? I'm asking, is it? Does this distinction make sense? In us, what we are and that we are are not true of us in virtue of the same thing. To put it very simply, you do not exist because you are human. It is not being human that makes you be. Rather, being is something given to your humanity. Being is something that is joined to your humanity. Your humanity is made to be. It is not the essence of humans to be. Rather, to be is something that we receive in addition to our essence. Our essence is not the same as the existence by which we are. It is rather that which receives existence and is made to be. This is true of every material object, but this is also true of even immaterial creatures like angels and hypothetically disembodied human souls. In other words, it's not just that a thing is material that it depends for its existence. It's that a thing is finite and created that it depends for its existence. It's a thing whose essence is not existence itself that makes it composite. If, I can, if, if you're roughly in the ballpark on that, then you're really at the most fundamental level of composition and everything not God. That is to say, everything not God, from a grain of sand up to Michael the archangel, is composed in this way of existence and essence, of a principle of whatness and a principle of isness. Okay? When we say that God is not composed of parts, most fundamentally we mean this. That God is not composed of whatness, divinity, and isness. Rather, when it comes to God, if I say, um, if I say what is God, and you answer me uh, in the Greek words um, ha-on, which is how uh, the Septuagint translates uh, Exodus 14, ha-on, he is, you have strangely answered my question. Okay? If I say what is God, and you say he is I am, or he is. Um, you have answered the question, because in God, to be and to be God are not the same thing. Or, I'm sorry, are the same thing. In every creature, in everything not God, they are not the same thing. So in this most fundamental sense, God is the very existence by which God exists. God does not have existence in the sense of something possessed in addition to being God. Rather, God is the existence by which he is. Simplicity is this argument. That which makes God be is not something in addition to his godness. But that which makes you be is something in addition to your humanity. Okay? Um, in addition to this, um, this also means that all of God's attributes are identical with his essence. A creature's attributes, or at least many of them, are not identical with its essence. Um, a man or a woman might be good or wise or loving or not, and still be human. Does this make sense? Um, so I can say, if I take, if I take Raymond, uh, and I say, and I say uh, Raymond is wise, I'm predicating something of Raymond, wisdom in this case, um, and I'm saying it's true of Raymond. Now, is wisdom true of Raymond in virtue of his essence, his humanity? Is it being human that makes Raymond wise? And the answer is, no, it's not. Because Raymond could be a fool, Does it, right? I mean, I'm, and I'll, I'll, I'll line up there and say, um, and have been, and maybe, maybe will be again in some respect. In other words, being wise or being foolish or being tall or being strong or being, you know, fill in the blank, these are all things we are over and above being human. I am five foot eight. I used to say five foot nine when I was younger, just on my driver's license, you know, but that's not true. I'm five foot eight in the morning. I'm five foot eight. You know how you kind of stretch out a little bit at night. 
Um, five foot eight in the morning. Um, James being five foot eight is not true in virtue of my essence being human. Being five foot eight is a quality of being. It's an attribute of being that I have. It's technically quantity. It's a quantity. It's an attribute of being I have over and above being human. How do I know this? How do I know this for sure? Because I was once human and not five eight. My mom says that anyway. Right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I was once a lot shorter than this. I'm probably not going to get taller than this. I'm done dreaming about that. That's, that's not going to happen. Um, so that here's an attribute of being, namely quantity. I am five foot eight. My being five eight is actually something I am over and above being human. That's a composition of parts. In this case, um, this would be substance and accidents. Uh, accidents are just things that come upon a being and give it a new actuality over and above the actuality that it has in its essence. Um, so being 5'8 is more than being human. Being wise is more than being human. Um, being tired, being bored, um, running fast. All of these things are things that you can be that are real attributes of your being that you can possess over and above your essence. So that in you there's a composition of existence and essence, but also of essence and attributes. Not everything in you is your humanity. I mean, kangaroos can be five foot eight. If being five foot eight and being human were the same thing, then what's up with five foot eight kangaroos? You know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? In other words, there's a real distinction between essence and attributes. There is no real distinction between God's essence and God's attributes. To be God and to be wise are the same thing in God. To be wise or to be God and to be powerful to be God and to be good, to be God and to be, and then fill in the blank, whatever, are in fact in God the same thing. There's not a bit of this, godness, and then a bit of something not godness over and above it that adds to him to give him being that his essence doesn't give him. My essence doesn't give me five foot eight. My essence doesn't give me wisdom. That's something I have in addition to. There's nothing God has in addition to being God. By the way, to the title of the book, All That Is In God, you may have seen it. It looks very short, big title, short book, but this is the point. Um, all that is in God just is God. There's not in God, God, and then the other stuff God is over and above his divinity. Um, good. So in this, oh, by the way, and we depend upon those attributes to give us something. I depend upon the quantitative attribute of five foot eight to give me the height that I have, okay? Um, now the really tricky uh, position. This also means, arguably, that in God, God's attributes are each identical with each other. That is to say, um, that in God, to be wise is not something really different in him than to be powerful. And to be powerful is not something really different in him than to be eternal. And to be eternal is not something really different in him uh, than to be loving, etc. Now that is the case in us. If, let's just take as an example, um, if I am, if I am uh, well, maybe that would be too easy. Uh, if I am... Um, foolish and powerful, these things may be really, at, really true attributes about me. They may be really true. James is a fool. James is a powerful fool. I mean, take, I mean you could just point to you know, Pol Pot or Mao or Stalin or Hitler. Um, fools with power. It's possible. Okay? Being foolish and being powerful are not the same thing in me. Because the thing is, I, I could be foolish and weak, which would be better for everyone else. Um, I could be powerful and wise. But these are not the same thing. So that my being powerful and my being wise or being foolish are not each of each themselves the same thing in me. To be one is ne not necessarily to be the other. The reason is because in me, metaphysically speaking, these things are really distinct qualities of my being. But if God is simple... God is, and by the way, I'm composed of parts. I'm composed of a bit of 5-8 and um, a bit of 5-8, a bit of forgetfulness, a, a bit of, you know, what, another, put it all together, I'm composed of all this and that just gives you the whole package. But God, in God, to be wise or good or powerful or true or eternal are not actually really distinct things God has all sort of collectively in him. Rather, this is just simply what God is in virtue of his essence. To be God and to be wise or to pow be powerful or true are all the same thing. John Owen says, the attributes of God, which alone seem to be distinct things in the essence of God, when he says seem to be, he means from our way of speaking about them, they seem this way to us, are all of them essentially, he says, the same with one another. In other words, in God, 
Wisdom is goodness, is power, is love, is justice, is truth, is eternity. But why? Because actually all of those things are just nothing but his own irreducible godness. Divinity, if you will. He says all of them are essentially the same with one another, and every one is the same with the essence of God itself. Um, What we're wanting to say then is that for God to be simple means that God's attributes are not technically speaking a set of powers or qualities he possesses. You and I and everything else that's composed of parts possess sets of attributes. That is to say, things that when you put put them all together collectively give us the the whole. But God's godness and God's being is not the consequent of a set of really distinct things comprised together, therefore producing him. Um, Thomas Morris at Notre Dame University said, um, in a most splendidly awful way of expressing this, um, that God is the greatest possible set of great-making properties. That sounds all technical. My brief response to that is, no, he's not. (laughs) My more elaborate response to that is, God isn't a set of properties. Rather, because sets are dependent upon the components of which Uh, the set is made, in which case God would be reducible to something not God in order to explain. In other words, um, I like to say it this way. Um, Don't put one part wisdom, one part goodness, one part power together, one part eternity. Um, Shake well, (laughs) right? And then the wonderful concoction is divinity, okay? Divinity is not the consequent of some mixture or putting together of something that is not divinity, okay? Not the greatest possible set of great making properties, even though, as Owen says, from our standpoint, we talk like this. I mean, you'll notice that I haven't said anything very simple yet about the simple, simple God. Wait a minute. If God's simple, how come you're using so many words? And how come this is so confusing? Um, Good question. Um, The reason being because while God is simple, we do not have the ability to express simplicity simply. And the reason is because we are not simple and our ways of thinking are not simple. And by the way, I think in Scripture, um, God mercifully accommodates himself to that ordinary way of speaking. Can I talk about God's wisdom and God's power and God's love and God's justice? In other words, multi-part statements? Yes, what I can't say is that my multi-part way of thinking and speaking, as it were, captures a multi-part way of being in God. That's what I need to be careful of. I'll I'll return to that theme toward the end. Um, Good. The fundamental, so while, while, it certainly, uh, while it certainly makes things perhaps confusing, Peter Sandlin says um, that simplicity makes claims about God that are profound, counterintuitive, and difficult to articulate, and that it recasts everything we say about God. Sandlin is absolutely correct. Um, it does make things <coughs> more odd. To say that God's wisdom is God's power, is God's justice, is God's love, certainly seems more peculiar because I just don't know anything like that. I'm not that way. Nothing else I know is that way. Um, Nevertheless, for all that, I think the fundamental rationale is compelling, and it's simply this. All parts are causes or principles of being that are really distinct from the entities in which they are incorporated. That's the first premise. Um, Secondly, Things composed of parts depend upon sources of being, namely the parts and the composer of them, more fundamental than the whole, and things that are, in one sense, prior to themselves. Thirdly, that God cannot depend on what is not himself in order to be himself. With these three principles, I think we can say the doctrine of simplicity is is a well-reasoned Christian position about the irreducibility of God and his godness. So what biblical support do we have for this doctrine? This is my second concern, the main biblical support. And this is not where I'm going to do uh, lengthy exegesis, but simply point you to different sorts of statements in Scripture that that support or lend lend viability to this um, claim, or even arguably generate the claim. Uh, And what we're saying here is not that there's a proof text any more than there's a proof, any more than there's a text that says everything the Nicene Creed says about the Trinity. Is there a text that says everything that we're saying here about simplicity, but rather it follows by way of a good and necessary consequence from other things that scripture explicitly states. Um, And theologians look at different sorts of data. Um, I'll just tell you now, I think the most important uh, set of biblical data is the third one I'll consider, which is the doctrine of creation. 
Um, I think that that is the most compelling um, of all sets, but I'll, I'll first just begin by mentioning divine independence, or what in theological literature is called divine aseity. Um, if that sounds odd to you, I'll break it down. To say God is say is just a Latin way of saying God is of himself. That is to say, the reason for God is God. The reason for your Toyota Camry is not your Toyota Camry. It's the tires and the drive shafts and the fuel injectors. In other words, it's all the other stuff. Um, the reason for you is not your humanity. Rather, it's the other things you, it's the existence you have in addition to being human, and it's all the attributes you have in addition to being, in addition to being human. But the reason for God is simply God's own self. He is self-sufficient or independent. That is to say, nothing not God makes him be or makes him operate. I just simply call this God's of himselfness, if you can put it like that. Um, the reason for God is God. Negatively, we, in, we say this by saying that God is independent in being. Uh, in Acts 17.25, uh, contrasting the creator God to the gods of the nations and the gods in the, of the Athenians, um, Paul says that the God who created all things is not served by human hands, he says, as though he needed anything. That's his, that's his qualifying cause. Um, that God is not the one who receives being or augmentation or enhancement or whatever, whatever you want to call it um, from the creature. God gives to all generously life, breath, and all things, right? He says at the end of 1725. But God does not receive in turn from what is not God any aspect of his being. Paul says in Romans 1135, who has first given to him and it shall be repaid to him? Uh, the idea is that God is not on the receiving end of being. But things with parts are. Okay? Things with parts must be on the receiving end of being. But God in the scriptures is not. No one supplies to God what he lacks, and for this reason he is indebted to none. Romans 11.36, where we began. For from him and through him and to him are all things. That is to say, all things depend upon him, but God does not in turn depend upon others. Okay? In fact, there's a certain sense in which if, this weren't, if God weren't simple, that statement just couldn't be true. All things are from him, through him, and to him, but if he's composed of parts, God himself is from, do you watch this? Because holes are from their parts. They derive and depend upon their parts. God would be from whatever that thing is that is not equal to his divinity that his divinity depends upon to be the composite divinity it is. Does this make sense? So that if all things are from him, through him, and to him, then saying that he's without part seems to be a necessary conf uh, confession to maintaining the truth of that statement. Otherwise, there'd be something not God, namely those parts, because parts are not equal to holes, um, there'd be something not God upon which God himself depended so that God would be from, you name it, whatever the parts are. Okay? But they wouldn't be his divinity because parts are not equal to and the same as holes. Uh, in addition to this, we could point to uh, the biblical conviction of infinity. Now, Scripture doesn't use that term infinity, but it usually gets at this notion with the idea of fullness of being or unboundedness of being. That God is not the, kind, God is not the sort of being to which you can say, and here lie the edges of the great God. Can you find out the limit of the Almighty? Job 11. The answer is no. The reason is because there are none. In other words, when it comes to his greatness, his greatness of being is without measure. It is unbounded. It is actually uh, and positively infinite. So the psalmist says in Psalm, uh, excuse me, Psalm 145.3, great is Yahweh and highly to be praised, and his greatness is, it says, literally unfathomable. That is to say, um, without bottom. Okay? That there's an, that there's an, uh, when, it, when you, in other words, you'll never get down to the bottom of God because there is no bottom of God. Find that, you'll never find the last great thing about God's being because there is no last great thing about God's being. There's not this edge of divinity, so to speak, where the God's being, as it were, terminates at that point. These are all ways of saying that God is unbounded in his being. Even texts like, I am the first and I am the last, these sorts of statements. That God is not a being who is measured, rather he is immeasurable in his divinity. Why would this support uh, the notion of divine simplicity? Simply this, that no part could be actually infinite. Are we good on this? 
And the reason a part, whether a metaphysical or a physical part, can't be actually infinite is because parts must be, in as much as they are parts, less than the whole of the beings in which they inhere. Does that, does that make sense? A part, in order to be a part, is necessarily finite. It must be. Otherwise, it could not be less than the whole, in which case I take it it wouldn't be a part. Okay? Um, but it doesn't matter how many finite attributes you add together, you're never going to arrive at unboundedness. Does this make sense? I'll, I'll put it even more simply. Um, you can't get to infinity by adding lots of finitude together. Does this make sense? You can, in other words, finitude will never generate actual unboundedness in infinity. Nothing built out of finitude will ever be more than a great finite thing. Parts are necessarily finite. Therefore, things composed of parts are necessarily finite, even if they are great and immense finite beings. This is exactly what the Christian tradition is trying to avoid saying about God when it says that he's without parts. If you say that he has parts, you'll never be able to say that he's actually unbounded in his being because he would be bounded to the extent that he would have to be comprised out of something itself, not infinite. So that, you can't add finitude to get infinite art. Finally then, the doctrine I think that's most compelling in this regard uh, is the doctrine of creation itself. That all things that are in the world exist by his will, the 24 elders say in Revelation 4.11, um, by your will all things were, or, uh, by, uh, from you all things were created, and by your will they exist. Um, from Romans uh, 4.17, he calls that which is, does not exist to be or is existing. In other words, God is the one who is the absolute foundation of all that exists. Everything that is not God is made to be by God. Can I, can I say that as a basic Christian conviction? Everything that is not God is made to be by God. But parts are not the wholes of which they are parts. In other words, if God were composed of parts, there would have to be something in the world, not God, but also not creature. Does this make sense? There'd have to be something in the world that was neither God nor created by God. Um, Alvin Plantinga, uh, a modern uh, philosophical theologian, would argue uh, that, in fact, that's exactly the kind of theology that we are all required to have. In his argument back in 1980 against the doctrine of simplicity, um, this is exactly what he's saying we need to say, that there is God, the stuff God creates, and then the other stuff. Uh, eternal ideas. And by the way, the other stuff is that from which God composes himself. God, as it were, in Plantinga's view, God builds himself up out of parts that are not identical to himself. Um, I'm not going to go into the whole critique of why that's in fact impossible. When you get down to the level of existence, um, nothing that is not can make itself be because you have to be to do. Does that make sense? To make a thing, you have to be already. Therefore, God cannot be self-made in the absolute sense. You has to, if, if God is self-made in the absolute sense, then you're describing an absolute impossibility. Something that is not is the reason for is. That's, I submit that that's not just theologically objectionable. That's quite literally what we mean when we say things like nonsense. That is quite literally nonsense. Um, if all things are from him, through him, and to him, and God is not from something not himself, but rather all things not God are from God, then of course there can be no parts, which would not be God, of which he's composed. This is, these are just samplings of sort of historically um, the types of texts that Christians go to to say this is what motivates this Christian conviction that God's without parts. Um, I, think it's well, I think it's well motivated um, in as much as we want to avoid all, the, all theological descriptions of God that turn his divinity or his operation into a dependent reality. That would be to reduce him to the level of a finite um, and caused being. Finally then, uh, a little bit of historical witness, uh, just to hear the voices of the past. Who has talked this way? Well, Christians down the ages, probably by the middle of the second century, the early Christian apologists, Athenagoras for sure, and others, um, are already invoking the doctrine of simplicity as though it were a commonplace in Christian uh, conversation and Christian theology. And Irenaeus of Lyon, um, uh, a Greek-speaking pastor who's really kind of a, a, a frontier pastor in the West and currently on France, um, writes a, a great book um, against heresies. Okay? Um, and you, can still, you can find the full text online for free. Um, against heresies. Um, Irenaeus dies in 202 AD, so if you can think of his writings, this is mostly late 2nd century. 
Uh, and in his argu- and, and Irenaeus at one point is arguing against the critics, some of the Greek critics that argue that a true God can't be the creator of the world. And the idea uh, in the Greek mind was that um, the reason that the true God cannot be the creator of the world is because creation would necessarily involve any creator in some change. In other words, if you, tr- if you create, then you'd have to somehow be changed by the act of creating. And therefore, if God is really, if God is really impassable and immutable and simple and without parts, then um, God cannot be the absolute creator of the world. Um, it's got to be something else. And for, and for the Greeks, especially the Neoplatonists that were emerging about this time, um, some kind of demiurge or demigod, we might say, some semi-divine intermediary being was thought to be the one that created the world. In response to this, and I don't, I'm not going to unpack his whole response, but in response to this, Irenaeus writes um, in his against heresies uh, with regard to God, he's, he's simply stating this is what Christians believe, late second century. He is a simple uncompounded being without diverse members by the way Irenaeus is a great Trinitarian theologian when he says without diverse members um, he means really distinct parts that's his way of saying that and altogether like and equal to himself since he is wholly understanding and wholly uh, not H but WH holy understanding holy spirit holy thought and holy intelligence and holy reason and holy hearing and holy seeing and holy light and the whole source of all that is good and you're thinking what's why what's with this holy thing what he's simply saying is we cannot think of God we cannot think of light and wisdom and power as less than the being of God do you get what he's after here when he says holy light he means that light is not something that God is less than the totality of what God is and the same thing for um, reason, intelligence, spirit, thought, understanding. All that is in God just is God. This is, a, this is a very ancient, fundamental Christian conviction. He then says this, even as the religious and pious are wont to speak, means are tend to speak concerning God. Which I find a fascinating statement. What Irenaeus is saying is, This is what all really religious and pious people say about God. He's talking about Christian theologians. We don't know. Our doctrine of creation does not undermine our doctrine of simplicity. In fact, we hold the divine simplicity. And in fact, all of us pious people, whatever, are wont to speak this way. I take it that by the late second century, confessing that God is without parts, simple and uncompounded, is ordinary vanilla Christianity, which is orthodox Christianity. Um, Athanasius uh, adds a little bit to this uh, in his doctrine. And Athanasius, I won't go into this, but is the first one to sort of bring it into consideration of the Trinity as well and explain, begins to sort of explore how we situate simplicity and Trinity um, together. And I'll leave that aside because that's a whole other world of discussion in itself. Um, But he says this, particularly with regard to, to God being the creator of the system. The absolute source of the system of the world cannot himself be a system because here's the thing. We're appealing to God as the explanation of a multi-part universe in which we live. That's the system of the world. But if it turns out that God himself is but yet another system of being, does this make sense? That is to say, a multi-part reality, the world, what do we appeal to to explain a multi-part reality? We we appeal to God. But if it turns out that God is a multi-part reality, then you know what the problem is? We're now going to have to find the explanation for that system. Does this make sense? So the the system is what needs explanation. The multi-partedness, why there are so many things holding together, what explains that? We appeal to God. But if God is a being of multi parts holding together, we will have to seek to explain what causes that to be the case as well. And and Athanasius says this, for God is a whole and not a number of parts and does not consist of diverse elements, but is himself the maker of the system of the universe. What's the juxtaposition he's making here? You can't explain a system in terms of another system and actually get to the end of the question. You just simply push the question back a step. What makes everything hold together? What makes diversity hold together? Well, God does. But if God is a diversity holding together, then you can legitimately ask the question, well, what makes that the case? He says, but no, God explains the world system, but not because he is another system. Rather, he is not a number of parts. For see what in piety they utter against the de- deity when they say this. <laughs> this is actually similar to Irenaeus. Irenaeus says, the pious and the holy say that he's without parts. Um, Athanasius is saying, what impiety when they say that he's composed of parts? 
He says, he, if he consists of parts, certainly it will follow that he is unlike himself and made up of unlike parts. Augustine, jumping forward two centuries, says this, arguing for the unchangeableness of each person of the Godhead. He says, if for this reason, uh, it is for this reason then that the nature of the Trinity is called simple. And it has not, uh, because it has not anything it can lose, and because it is, not, it is not one thing and its contents another. In other words, to be God and to be powerful, or to be God and to be wise, um, are not really distinct things. Its being and its contents, um, it, it's not that it, its being is one thing and its contents another, as a cup and a liquor, or a body and its color, or the air and the light, or the heat of it, or a mind and its wisdom, for none of these is what it has. Um, sounds complex. What he means is simply this. Um, let's just take the, uh, a body and its color. Here's a body, it's a lectern, um, and its color is black. To be a lectern and to be black are not the same thing. There's a real distinction here, because I take it that there could be lecterns that weren't black and still lecterns. So therefore, the body, the lectern, and the color of the body are not the same reality. Ne rather, they are a composite reality. Okay, he's saying God isn't like this. For God to be God and God to be whatever else God is is in fact not like anything else we're talking about. A bit of this and a bit of the other, put them together and you get the whole. Rather, he's not like this at all. He says, for the human spirit is not, of course, uh, for the human spirit, it is not, of course, the same thing to be and to be courageous or to be sag sagacious or just or moderate. In other words, to be a human and to be a wise human to be a human and to be a moderate, self-controlled human are not the same thing because there are humans that are not self-controlled and there are humans that are not wise, and but they're still humans. Okay? So he says, for the human spirit uh, to be wise or to be and to be courageous and wise and moderate, he says, it can be a human spirit and have none of these virtues. For God, for God, it is the same thing to be as to be powerful or just or wise or anything else that can be said about his simple multiplicity and multiple simplicity. Um, what he's saying is, in you, it is really diff for you to be human and for you to be wise are really not the same thing. There's, they're, they're, this, they're, they're both true about you, the concrete individual, but they're not the same thing in you. Those are really distinct things that you have. All right. With that said, um, one, uh, I'll give you one, just one last from, from our A team. We'll stay with uh, Anselm in this case. <laughs> Anselm praying to God in his proslagion, uh, which is very much uh, Augustinian. If you've read Augustine's Confessions, um, it's just one great, big, gigantic prayer to God. He's addressing himself to God in prayer. It's a written prayer. That's all it is. The proslagion of Anselm, uh, uh, in the, Anselm, lives, uh, Anselm dies in 1109, if you want to sort of locate him in late medieval period. Um, Anselm, an Augustinian monk, actually writes his treatises like a prayer, very Augustinian. He says this in his proslogion, speaking to God. You are so much a unity, so much identical with yourself, that you are in no respect dissimilar to yourself. You are, in fact, unity itself. You cannot be divided... Um, by any understanding. Therefore, life and wisdom and the rest are not parts of you. They are all one. Each of them is all of what you are. Very much like Irenaeus a millennia earlier, right? Um, holy wisdom, holy light, holy. Each of them is all of what you are, and each is what the rest are. God's wisdom is God's goodness, is God's power, is God's justice. And since you have no parts, and neither does your eternity, which you yourself are, it follows that no parts of you or your eternity exists as a certain place or a certain time. Instead, you exist as a whole everywhere and your eternity exists as a whole always. Completeness, superabundance of being. Not a bit of this, that, and the other together, but rather holy. Now to this question, I'll leave this as a final sort of remark. We'll leave the medievals. Aquinas then develops this a little more, um, but doesn't actually offer a new doctrine, just gives some, uh, some precision to what was already handed down to him. And then the reform do effectively the same thing, all the way down to like Louis Burkhoff writing in the 20th century. Again, it's going to sound like Augustine and Anselm and Athanasius and later Aquinas. Um, the question that perhaps raises in our minds, and I'm just going to anticipate this maybe as one that could be asked, is why then is my thought of God so seemingly disjointed from the manner of his being? If the manner of his being, in other words, if God is simple, why don't we just say this? Instead of saying God is wise, good, loving, just, true, and eternal, if God's really simple and these aren't really distinct things in God, why not just say God? Yeah, you see what I mean? In other words, why don't we have a simple 
just sort of non-composite, multi-part way of talking if, about God if God is a non-composite, non-multi-part being. How, what gives? Why all the multiplicity of God talk if we're talking about a God who is not a multiplicity of parts? Um, the answer given historically uh, is, uh, when I say historically, I mean from the early church right down to someone like Burkhoff in the 20th century, is that with regard to the manner of God's revelation and with regard to the manner by which God gives us words to speak about him, God accommodates himself to our way of knowing and speaking is irreducibly multi-part. When I, when I make a statement about God, like God is love, that's a multi-part statement, right? Um, there's a subject, God, and there's a predicate, love. In the statement you just heard, the subject and the predicate are not the same term. And for us, it might be tempting to think, therefore, they must not be the same thing. And like if I just said, if, if I said, um, John is strong, I, there's a multi-part statement, subject John, predicate strong. And it turns out that my multi-part way of speaking about someone named John corresponds to a multi-part way of being. Because it turns out that being John and being strong are not just distinct in my statement, they're also distinct in John. Is that fair enough? Well, you, wouldn't, you don't want to say you're weak. I get it. I understand. So, you know, but, but my multi-part way of speaking about things more or less syncs up with and sort of mirrors the multi-part realities about which I speak. But if we come to the question of God, when I come back to God is love, when I say God is love, that's a multi-part statement, but I am not suggesting that God and love are really distinct in God. Does this make sense? God, it's not God plus love that makes God the God of love. Rather, being God is what makes God the God of love. So that to say God is love, love is already included in terms of God's being in the simply in the statement God. Being God and being love are in fact same thing even if in my statement about God they're not the same term what is God what is this God allows us to use multi-part language by the way because that's how we communicate that's how we think we think in terms of propositions and sequences and bits of this and that and the other put together and by the way God also reveals himself in a multi-part way sometimes he reveals his power he reveals his wrath he reveals his love. And these revelations are not all identical in the way that we see them and process them or the way that Scripture records them for us. So that as God shows us the fullness of his being, he doesn't show us the fullness of his being in naked fullness. He shows us the fullness of his being in an unfolding manifestation of that being one thing after another, after another, after another. Not because there's one thing after another in God, but rather the showing of the simple God is showing itself in a multi-part, sequential, bit-by-bit -bit way. Okay? So God shows himself to us bit-by-bit, bit, but not because he exists bit-by-bit. Does this make what we're after here? So that the manner of God's being in himself and the manner of God's showing of himself and speaking to us about himself are not, in this sense, strictly symmetrical. There's a certain non-commensurability in our God talk and the being of God. There's a certain way in which our God talk does not actually sync up in a one-to-one -one way with the manner of God's being. I always put it this way. Um, have you ever had a thought of the infinite God? Have you ever had an infinite thought of the infinite God? No. So that there's all, I just, that's the easiest one, but I can say this. Have you ever, I mean now tonight, have you had a thought of the simple God? I hope so. Have you had a simple thought of the simple God? I haven't. Um, I'm not suggesting you're about to, and I'm not suggesting that this is what we need to do, turn all of our theologizing into simple God talk. God doesn't expect that of us. He expects of us to be what we are as creatures, multi-part, thinking in multi-part ways, predicating in multi-part ways, but all the while realizing that our multi-part ways of thinking and speaking and knowing God do not in a certain sense capture or measure the manner of God's being God. All right, I leave it with that. That's my sort of your sort of immersion into the deep end of what is the doctrine of simplicity, what motivates it, what are some of its basic claims, a few voices from the past, and maybe we can open up for questions. Are we at that point? So what I'd like to do, one, before I forget, just remind me, if you're a guest with us, we have guest cards over here. Uh, if you can fill those out for some reason, we pray for you. Happy to put that on there. If you'd like more information about Sunday Night Theologies, 
Please put that on the guest card on the back and we will send you information about Sunday Night Theology. As we think through that, we have Sunday Night Theology cards for the next semester as well. And I just want to take a moment and kind of highlight as we're kind of decompressing real quick before Q&A. This has been a really heavy Sunday Night Theology, and I do that when I ask James to come to us. And I want us to see the importance of that with the type of question I'm about to ask as we also look forward to relief in 2019 with some very practical Sunday Night Theology. We're going to be discussing the nurture of the family, the doctrine of death. We're going to be dealing with raising sexually faithful kids. The doctrine of mm. dealing with prayer. Don Whitney will be with us. So I just want to encourage everyone to think that. As we think carefully tonight, and focus on uh, focus on this. Dr. Dolezal, I want to turn our attention to, to Luke real quick. Luke 2.52. His book really was one of the most, uh, most helpful books to me in the last few years. And as I'm thinking, it's important for reasons like this. So we're thinking of God's, God's immutability. He doesn't change. Mm -hmm. uh, we're thinking of God's impassibility without passion. But Luke 2.52, I'm a Bible. Come to Luke 2.52. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. What does it mean for God to tell us that Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature? Does that verse disprove everything you just said about divine simplicity it's a great question yeah the oh did jesus change answer simple answer yes of course he did jesus g and i'll, I'll explain why. my former students will know that i'm a i'm a sucker for christology questions if you ever want to like derail uh, a dolzell talk just bring in christology and then like i never find my way back so you've 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 you you know you located um simply to put when i say does jesus change we need to speak about christ in two ways and two ways at once and it can be very difficult to do we need to speak about christ in terms of both natures and things proper to each nature so that when we speak about the son as divine the son is simple immutable eternal unchanging impassable etc when we speak about the same son as man everything that we can say about man except sin we can say about Christ um, that he had a body, that he had a digestive system, that he, uh, that he learned things, that he didn't know things. Um, all of these things that might have to do with finitude, not moral imperfection in any respect, of course, but finitude, Jesus, in so much as he is man, is created. That is to say, Jesus' humanity is just as much creature as your humanity is. And Jesus' humanity is just as much dependent as your humanity is. And since simplicity is all about ruling out dependency, and since his humanity is dependent, there's no, re to, no, there's no reason to argue for a simplicity of humanity. And there's every reason to believe that his humanity is as composite as any other humanity is. So in this case, you're talking about an accident. That's wisdom. Wisdom is something, accident means something that comes upon you. That's actually all it means. So you get in an accident, what you're actually saying is something came upon me. When philosophers say, ad cadere, to befall a thing, okay? Um, when, you, when you get wisdom, something befalls you. New knowledge, it's an accident. It adds to you. It makes you, a know, it makes you to know in a way you did not know before. Does Jesus increase in knowledge um, in terms of his human mind? His human mind is not um, his omniscient divine mind. We believe in two natures with two minds, one proper to, those, to each nature. So I would say, in so much as Jesus is a man, we can say, um, passable? Absolutely. I mean, that's our hope as second Adam. I hope he's passable and with passions. I mean, that's that whole thing about the Passion Week, that he undergoes passions um, in my place, suffering in my stead, and that he learns, that he grows, that he's composite, you name it, um, that he's mutable, that he's temporal. Everything that we can say about creature saves sin, we can say about Christ in terms of his humanity. Um, Just for clarification, so where so you're stating that before he became in the garden, that he had the same knowledge as the Father, and then once being born, he didn't have the exact same knowledge. No, that's not, I'm not saying that because that oper that's a great question, Josh. That operates on a one mind view. So there's this, what I kind of call the problem of the either or Christology. It's the view that says Jesus, the son can only operate according to one nature at a time. Either he's infinite in knowledge, Psalm 147.5, um, or he doesn't know things, like doesn't know the day or the hour, as he says. Either he's equal to the father, or the father is greater than he, you know, as he says. Um, 
what we want to do is avoid an either or Christology. I call that a, if you want my fancy word for it, I call it functional monophysitism, which is to say Jesus can only operate according to one nature at a time. I think you really like your just like simple way of saying it to yourself. That is, yeah, that's, that is seriously how bad, no. Brother, that is how bad it is. Like that to me is actually my shorthand, which is like I, I need, yeah. Yeah, no, anyway, but this idea that Jesus can only do one thing at a time according to one nature or another. So it's kind of, I, I put it this way in a kind of cute and maybe demeaning way, but it's kind of like he's got two pair of trousers. He's got the God trousers and he's got the man trousers. and He's got to decide he can only wear one pair of trousers at a time. I'm going to do something divinely or I'm going to do something humanly. What we want to do is avoid that entirely and say, no, at the very moment, I'll just get right down to it, at the very moment by which G, in which Jesus hangs suffering upon the cross in his humanity, he upholds the worlds by the word of his power according to his deity. So that his deity does not either suspend, go into mothballs, you know, whatever, stand aside for his humanity. The person of the Son does not need to displace one nature to make room for the function of another nature. And in that respect, then, Jesus is, in terms of his human mind, eternally omniscient, never growing in knowledge, but rather the source of all things knowable that transpire. And in terms of his human mind, he is not so omniscient. And that both are what we the temptation for us is to think that Jesus as a person sort of um, stands outside of these natures and sees both at once so that it sounds like, well, if he knows all things according to his divinity, then he can't really not know things according to his humanity. I think that I think that misunderstands how the human and the divine relate in God so that we can say, I mean, I'd be like saying he couldn't really be creature in his humanity if he's really creator. But no, he's both. He's really immutable in his divinity and really mutable in his humanity um, and really infinite in his divinity and really finite in his humanity. And we need to say them in a way that we don't sort of displace one in order to fit the other. It's a great. So we, I feel, we believe that God is the and so all of the attributes that we use rightly to describe God are eternally true of God. So I just could you clarify a little bit how some of the attributes that we uh, would would ascribe to God seem to be just contingent by their nature, like the, sure, like in order to be a creator, one must be. So yeah. That's a great question. Um, I deal with the creator part of that question in one of the chapters in my book, um, and I deal with it. I mean, part of it's cathartic for me. I'm sort of trying to undo a long train of thought in my own mind, which is this. Creation is not eternal. God is the creator. Therefore, if creation is not eternal, God being creator is not eternal. Therefore, being creator must be something God became after previously not being the creator. Um, I think we should at least say what that means. That means that there's time with respect to God because there's literally chronological before and after. Um, it means that there is change of being with respect to God, being one thing at, and then being something more other than that. Um, so it gets into a question of does, does showing himself, do, does the, can I put it this way, does newness in his production necessarily correspond to newness in his being? And the answer is no, but newness in his production does correspond to newness in the way that we speak about him. And in fact, Scripture will, in, in countless places, I'm looking at one here in, in Isaiah 63, Scripture will allow us to use even the language of becoming to describe God in so much as we are newly related to God. When we enter into new relations with God, God will often say, I became. I'll just give you an example. Um, Isaiah 63, he said, Surely they are my people, sons who will not deal falsely. So he became their Savior. Got it? I mean, you'll, I mean, you can find texts like that all over Scripture. What is this becoming? Where is it located? And what, if, what is its character? Well, what we don't want to say is that it's a becoming of being. We don't want to say that be, God began to be what God was not, but we can say that there was a becoming with respect to the way in which we speak of God. In fact, if you call God your Savior, but once he was your adversary before your regeneration, can we say God was my enemy and is no longer, and God is my friend and is my Savior, whereas before he was not? Yes, but where do you locate exactly the newness of being? If you locate it in God, then you run, down, uh, you run into a number of problems. The first one of which is um, you have to explain how God began, to God began to be in new ways if, in fact, he's really infinite. 
In other words, if you really believe that God is unbounded in his being, then there cannot be newness of being in him. That, or maybe put it simply, um, infinity cannot be added to. Okay? Only finitude can be added to. Only finitude can begin to be. But there can be a beginning to be in terms of both the dispensations of his plan and the revelation of himself and in the way that creatures relate to him. And in so much as he, br- in so much as he c- brings a people to himself, from their relation to him, there's a newness in their relation, that of people saved, so that they can say he became their creator. But again, I, what we don't want to do is say that something God wasn't in himself ontologically, God began to be, because then you get into the whole sourcehood problem, which is what gave God the new being God didn't have? God now is something God wasn't. There's a sufficient reason question, which is what explains the newness of being in God? If you say, well, God explains it, then you have to explain how it is that he then lacked it. In other words, if he received the new being from himself, how did he receive new being from himself if he didn't have it? And if he did have it, then of course he didn't receive it. Anyway, so you go down that path. What I think we should say is we should talk about it in terms of the new relation of creatures to God the newness of the way in which we relate to God and which he reveals himself and the newness of his plan as it unfolds allows us to predicate a newness of God. What we should do is be careful not to say that the newness is a newness of being in God as such. It's a newness of his creature in relation to God such that we begin to call him things like Savior and Father that we didn't call him before. It's a dicey, that's a hard, that's a hard one. Um, and it, it's, it depends on how committed you are to this fullness of being notion. Um, if you're not very committed to it, then it's going to be much easier to say, yeah, God can become in some non-essential ways. But then, of course, that's composition because the newness of being wouldn't be identical with God. Like, that's the thing. If this, this would be, saviorhood would not be the same of, as divinity if it were something really new in God. Does that make sense? Um, and then you'd have God and then the stuff not identical with Godness that made him be more, and ab- more over and above what he is as God. We want to avoid that. Oh, sorry. That, and I'll try to and I'll try to be brief. Sorry, I, I tend to. Great, great. <laughs> so Good. my question is kind of more to do. I think the subset of the critique you're talking that kind of cool. So if it's silly, you can tell me. Yeah. So okay, so everyone knows what we So what would you say actually makes us human? Not scientifically, but philosophically, practically. Like, are there qualities or exhibits? Uh, Ooh. Can I go with the first one and then the other ones are the other ones are Christian anthropology uh, and big. Uh, Oh, okay. I, I haven't. All right. On what makes humans human? Um, it is uh, the human essence that makes human humans. Now, what is a human essence? Uh, it's it's that which determines a thing to be. It, it's that which determines a thing to be of a certain kind. In particular, what kind? If you're saying philosophically, um, I think rational animal is decent. It's certainly not enough from the spiritual standpoint of what it is to what is our relate what we are as humans in relation to God and in His world as image bearers and as as those that have you know and everything that comes with image bearing. But um, I think I think it kind of gets at um, wh- what we don't want to do, and this is sort of contra John Locke and everything else since Locke is say um, that essences themselves um, are sort of. Um, sort of critic, a critical mass of a bit of this, that, and the other. Um, I think we want to watch out for that and simply say that there is such a thing as a nature, and natures are what determine things to be. Your nature to be human involves two things. It, it involves um, your soul and involves your soul as determining a body to be of a certain kind. In other words, to be human is to be a soul-body composite with a certain set of features, particularly um, powers of will and rationality. How's that different than an angel? An angel is not technically determined to a specific sort of body, and that's what explains demon possession and all that. But anyway, it's, it's a different, uh, I would say, I would say, and that I could point you to some books, but they're kind of technical, but they're good ones uh, that talk about what makes a human a human. In terms of the Imago Dei question, though, um, 
I'll leave, that, I'll leave that aside, except only to say that I don't take the Lutheran view that you can actually lose the imago. I think that there's a narrow and a broad sense to the imago day, so that you, while you can lose the image of God in terms of moral capacity, there are also features of the imago day that extend beyond our moral condition, in which case even fallen humans remain, even unsaved humans remain in the image of God. Um, and that's more of a Catholic and Reformed view as opposed to a Lutheran view. 